Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Aditi Javeri, and I'd like to welcome you to Out of the Box, an event organized by Asia Society Hong Kong in collaboration with Dear Hong Kong. And I'd like to um, invite Vivek Mebubani and Oscar Badges for a discussion on diversity and alternative career paths. Vivek Mebubani and Oscar Vajas will talk to us today about how it is indeed possible to go off the beaten track and still have a very successful career. While you may be familiar with both speakers and their work in Hong Kong, here are a few interesting facts about them. Vivek Mebubani, as most of you probably know, is an award-winning comedian who was crowned the funniest in Chinese award in Hong Kong in 2007. He then went on to win the Hong Kong International Comedy Competition in 2008. The famous Laugh Factory in USA ranked Vivek as one of the top 10 comedians uh, in their annual funniest person in the world competition in 2000. And you would think the list ends here, but it doesn't. And then in 2015, he was selected to represent Asia's best comedians in the Comedy Zone Asia uh, inaugural show. So the list of his accolades is almost unending. But then in 2016, he was featured in Comedy Central's first ever Stand Up Asia. I have watched him perform quite a few times and can attest to the fact that his humor stands out for its understanding of human nature, cross-cultural issues, and his ability to make us see that in the end, we are a lot more similar than dissimilar. Oscar Badges is one of the creators of the social project and photo book, Dear Hong Kong, which you probably have heard about. Um, this celebrates the cultural diversity of the city and its personal stories that inspire while breaking cultural and um, other stereotypes. Although he started his career journey in Hong Kong as a finance executive for a multinational corporation, he left that to volunteer for organizations helping migrant populations. At the same time, his interest in people and cultures and diversity in Hong Kong made him want to take steps in the direction to celebrate this diversity we have in Hong Kong uh, through a more concerted effort. So his co-founded project, Dear Hong Kong, has so far interview interviewed more than 100 people from various different backgrounds in Hong Kong. And um, they launched their campaign in 2019. So you've seen how much work they have done. Um, through this campaign, he believes the bridge between people of various ethnicities uh, in Hong Kong can be bridged. Welcome, Vivek. Welcome, Oscar. Hello. Thank you very and much. Thanks so much <laughs> for being here today. We can't wait to hear from you. You've come, you are two shining examples of people who have done things that other people dare not do and made it their career. How do you get to this point? Uh, very briefly, let's start with this overview question. Well, let me start with, I, I, I personally just want to say that, uh, first of all, the key is when you're young, daydream more, and eventually you forget to listen to the career talks that they have in school. But also number two, it's really a lot of not uh, following the trend just because that's the way it works for people. I think for myself growing up in Hong Kong in a predominantly Chinese community, uh, very often when all my classmates being Chinese, they would say, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And I was like, well, I don't know. Everything I do that you do doesn't seem to work, so I got to do something opposite. So if you want to be a lawyer, I got to do the same thing, but not legal. Do something completely opposite where I'm a, I'm a joker, that sort of a deal. So that's how it all began, really. Just the fact that you couldn't fit in, so you forced you to kind of stand out in your own way. That is wonderful. Yeah. I think, as Vivek said, it's a, it's, a, it's a question of getting comfortable with uh, being uh, out of what uh, is perceived as normal, and then you feel free to, to just be yourself, which I think is the, is the key for, for doing uh, things that you feel very comfortable about, and, and you can actually redefine your definition of success in life, which can be very different from the standard one. 
All I right. think one that... formula Oscar and myself share is that uh, if you have a name that no one can pronounce correctly, you probably end up with a career that is completely different because <laughs> no HR person's hiring you for a proper job with that. That's name. Really good. <laughs> so, what is your definition of success? Would you like to share your ideas among each other and, of course, with the audience? I, mean, well, I, I think in like the in yeah, go Oscar, you first, you first. No, I think in, in the in the conversation we had, uh, we recognize like uh, we we agree on the on, on many things that uh, we had in our during our past uh, many similarities. And I think uh, I mean for me the 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 very definition of success is just doing what whatever you feel comfortable with. Just be try to be as close as you, the real you as possible without uh, caring so much about uh, you know the the standards of uh, career and the. The complexities of this uh, consumer society, and just try to be uh, tap into your your magic to be able to do things that you feel very comfortable with. And if you feel very comfortable with something, you're going to do a pretty good job. I think. I think it's very true. I mean, one thing I find is that when we think of success, we're thinking like, you know, successful in their career and stuff. But the truth is, very often you may love what you do, but there are days that you're like, I just don't want to do it. Like there are days when I wake up, I'm like, I really do not want to be talking to people at all. But if I had an alternative, okay, what else would you like to do? I'm like, oh, I'm kind of lost. You know, I actually, this is what I want to do, even though I don't want to do it today. So in its own way, success is when you're doing what you want to do, that basically you have no other thing you would rather do, be doing that in one way is successful. And number two, as Oscar said, the key is being willing to go against what everyone agrees that you should be doing, what is normal, and also ultimately knowing what you want. I think one thing that Oscar and myself have probably spent a lot of time is kind of figuring out what the hell do we even want? Like, what is it that I want to be doing? I mean, I can do A and B and C, but do, is that what I want to be doing? Just because I can doesn't mean I should. I mean, very. I mean, I could definitely be, let's say, a salesperson. I could definitely sell cars and everything. But is that what I want to be doing on a daily basis? Versus, I could sell this joke. So I'm still a salesperson, but I'm selling jokes instead of cars. So that kind of variation takes a lot of it. And I think success is when you figure out that one thing you want to do that you have nothing else you'd rather be doing it, and then I think you've achieved it. I think a lot of uh, youngsters who are listening to this must be thinking. Yes, it's, uh, it's a very idealistic idea to be doing what we want to do. But will that result in monetary rewards? Will that bring us uh, a way to sustain our living, our livelihood? We have responsibilities. We have uh, to take care of our parents. Um, how do we uh, you know, explain this procedure to them? Because clearly it's not easy. It's not just easy to go for what you, uh, what you want and what you want to be. So how do we navigate these challenges that life throws to us, especially considering that we all need money and some of the careers that we may desire may not actually pay that well or pay nothing at all? Yeah, I think first I it's a question of, uh, you know, redefining what, uh, what you need. Like thinking, uh, being very honest with yourself is like, which type of requirements do I have? Do I need to buy a, a property in, in Hong Kong? which is one of the most expensive places in the world? Do I need to, to be super rich to, to be able to, to do the things I want after that, whenever I achieve that, that goal? So if first you're very honest with yourself and say, okay, this is how much I need to live uh, reasonably well. And then it's a question of uh, trying to, of course, you can, you can follow your heart and uh, do things that you love. And, and then maybe at the same time, you can do things that you don't love as much, but maybe they will facilitate that, uh, that you get enough, uh, enough money to sustain yourself and keep on doing the things you, you love. I think that's the, that's the key to listen to both, not only say like, okay, I wanna be a lawyer because uh, you know, this, uh, this career pays really well, but then I'm, I mean, society is gonna force me to do something that I don't like for the rest of my life. Maybe I'm very good at it, but I just don't, don't like it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think Oscar said it perfectly. If you look at both of our careers, we actually had like, let's say, full-time jobs or jobs that were typical. And then we were doing it, as he said, it's kind of like you have bills to pay. No one's denying that. But is that the end game? Is basically that job, the final job you're going for? Is that like a, like a stepping stone? So a lot of people, even look at like, let's say people who want to do acting and everything, they might have a job as a wait staff, whatever. Obviously, that is not the final game and the final goal, but they understand that I need to sustain it. So when I first started comedy back in 2007, 
And it wasn't like I just plunged completely into it and that was what I want to do. But I would do that on the side for free, for fun, for whatever. But I would still be my little web developer during the day dealing with programming and all that kind of stuff. But I knew that I loved both sides. But as comedy grew, I was like, hey, you know what? I can let go of this side a bit because this side seems to have some sort of income. So you build it like that. So in many ways, you can think of it this way where I used to be in a band. I used to play drums and I knew there's no way we're going to do world tours and everything. So that was purely a, a burning money thing that I love to do. So I would go there, just jam with my friends and have a good time. But there was no real think of like, you know, how am I going to make money off of this one? But I had comedy and that was like, hey, I like that so much. And that seems to be like a market to it. But at the same time, not right now. I'm just one year into it. I'm not there where people are going to pay to listen to what I have to say. So as Oscar said, you have some work that you have to do because, you know, you have some bills to pay. But it doesn't mean that because you're a lawyer now, that's what you're doing, that you've given up on your dreams. It's like, okay, I need to pay these bills. I have these responsibilities. But on the side, maybe two hours a week, could I do that one thing I've always dreamt about? No one's stopping from taking up the camera and just going doing photo shoots for fun on the weekend. And you never know. After five years of practice, all of a sudden one friend is like, hey, I have a wedding. You want to help me shoot? Well, let's do it. Hey, my friend likes what you're doing. Can I book you for that? Let's do it. And boom, it all happens. So it's really a matter of like, don't think it's an all or nothing thing. It's not <laughs> like uh, my dream is to be a photographer. So I've got to quit everything and just go for it. You <laughs> can, no one's stopping you, but it's a weird strategy to go with. And that's I think it's also a question of uh, energy, like the mm -hmm. amount of energy that you get when you're doing something that you you really like and it's, uh, it's related to your dreams. Like you get energy from that, from a job that you don't actually like. It's like it drains all your energy very easily. So I think it's good to, to balance uh, both. And, uh, you know, because, you know, through the Dear Hong Kong project, we have been interviewing people and uh, I like to ask people about what is the dream that you carry in your pocket with you that uh, you maybe didn't uh, give a space to, for it to grow. And, uh, and also like the volunteers that uh, work in our project, they, I mean, through, through volunteer is something that uh, you can always do to, to get into other fields because some people go like, okay, Maybe I'm a good drummer, but no, I'm not going to succeed on this. And then you kind of uh, skip it. But just uh, whatever is uh, your motivation, then just uh, volunteer in something related to it or just play with it and see, and see where it goes. I think it's totally worth to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. That's same is with my that comedy. the way you started? Because I read your bio and it says that you were a finance executive and you were working for a multinational corporation. So when you were working there, did you start volunteering and trying out these different things that you had a passion for? Absolutely. I mean, I quit. Uh, I mean, this, uh, this multinational, I quit the company two times. I came back. But in the meantime, I was, uh, I was traveling. I was volunteering in different places. And then I came back. I worked a little bit more on it. And then I quit again. So I think, I mean, for me, it's a, like a career or life in general. It's like... A, it has different angles. You can you can work in something and then change into something else. It's not this idea that the society is telling us like, okay, you need to be uh, this and you need to be this for all your life. For, for me, I've been playing with it. Uh, like, uh, and finance, it was not my first uh, occupation. So I, mm -hmm. I, I studied computer science. I was a, a geek for a, for a while. Then I went into finance. Then I quit again. Then I volunteered. Then I even went to culinary school and I learned how to cook. So that, there was a lot of things. Uh, I started the travel business. Then I, I wrote this book with, uh, with my colleague, Eggy. So it's uh, like for me, uh, and it works differently for, for different people. You can redefine yourself. And, and actually, if you have a lot of things that you're interested uh, in, you can do a reasonably good job in them uh, for as long as you, you put your energy into it and you are interested on, on them. So, I mean, I want to tell people that are thinking about the career move or, or something that they could totally, if they feel like they should, they, they totally should go for it. Because uh, at the beginning, it may sound scary when you change uh, what you're doing. I, I have to say, like, I committed a, like a career suicide a few times <laughs> successfully. <laughs> like, a, like, it feels like a, you don't know, it's a lot of uncertainty and everything, but it always works. It always works if you, if you, if you keep on like uh, tapping into the things that you're interested in. Mm, thank you. And uh, Vivek, what about you? So um, you were a web developer, as you said. Would you say that you had saved enough money that you had the benefit of just going and trying out these things um, and, and maybe not doing uh, your work full time? So it's the idea that we save up enough 
so that we have a backup, we have a contingency plan to give more time to the things that we love to do. Absolutely. I mean, from the get go, I've always been kind of money conscious in the sense that from my beginning of my business, I was my own accountant. So I had to watch every dollar coming in and coming out. And I would have these small, small little silly strategies. For example, when I first started my web design business, every dollar was, you know, oh my God, it's another dollar I spent. So what I would actually do is I would put all my meetings with clients in one day, one after another. So I go to one coffee shop, sit one time, order one coffee, and it lasts for three meetings long. So basically that saves me 60 Hong Kong dollars, right? Wow. And secondly, yeah, these are the silly strategies I would have because I'm like, I can't afford $90 a day, you know, for three different meetings. So yeah. I would do that. The second thing I was like, wait a second, every time I go for a meeting and my client's sitting there, I'm kind of obliged to buy them a coffee because I came in and they're like, oh, you, you want a coffee? So what I would do, the meetings at three o'clock, I'd go that 250, get like the cheapest juice and sit there. So when the client arrives, I'm like, oh, you, you want to go get yourself a coffee first? And we'll sit down and talk. <laughs> Boom, saved another 30 bucks right there, you know? So yes. it, it, it's silly when I look at it now, but I'm like, those were the small numbers I had to do. So if I get cut $30 here, $30 there, now I've saved $200 a week, which I could use towards my hobby, you know, buying that equipment I wanted, maybe affording a mic or stuff, simple things like that, or buying a book about this or buying a DVD or something like that. So yes, you have to be very smart about that. Savings, regardless of having a hobby or not, I think you should be smart enough to have, let's say, a few months of savings just in case, you know, for a rainy day. But I would say it's not a matter of like, oh, wait until you've saved enough to take the risk. But it's really a matter of like, you don't have to say, I've got to spend money on this thing I want to do. Like if you want to be a photographer, nothing's stopping you from, let's say, reading a book, going online, just learning about it. Maybe your friend has a camera, go just borrow it. Get a secondhand camera just to learn the little small, small nuances here and there. So these small, simple, silly, cheap ways to kind of develop your skill without the actual spending of money is one method as well. Call me the good thing for me is that it, uh, I don't have to buy a guitar. I don't have to buy any equipment. I just go there and just show up and I talk and there you go. You don't get paid for it initially, but maybe the bar is nice. Like here, here's some fries. I'm like, yes, I got fries. That saves me $20 again. So small, small things like that I would do, but definitely. Yeah. Over time, you have to think about your investment of time and money. So as Oscar said, you do something you love, it doesn't drain your energy. It's kind of like saying, you know, writing a check really drains you. Like, oh, I got to write another check. But depositing a check, oh, you're recharged. You're like, let's do this. I'm ready for the weekend, you know. So same thing, same concept where if you've had a long day doing that job that you hate and you look forward to that one thing you're enjoying, then you, you will have something to look forward to. You still have the energy. So same with money as well. Sometimes you work hard, earn that money. You're like, but I want to spend it on this because this, this I enjoy. I want to go do this, you know, and it's worth it. Okay. And uh, Oscar, what has been your experience? Did you wait to save up all the money or when you had just about enough, you said, well, I can experiment and I can branch out into other things? Well, I would totally agree with Vivek uh, in terms of, uh, you know, having like uh, being, being very strict about your finances, right? And, and saving up uh, money for, for the future to be able to stay some time without income. I've been without income for the last five years. So I, I take those strategies to the extreme. We haven't done the thing in the Dear Hong Kong project, the, the Vivek's uh, trick for the coffee, <laughs> but we may do it in our interviews. We, we still need to interview more people. So we may do that. But, you know, we have been able to, to start this project without, uh, without giving any salary to anybody. And then having some, we did a crowdfunding campaign to get uh, some uh, backing up for our project and, and to be able to sustain ourselves uh, during this time. And to, 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 do, to do something that people would think like, oh, this is not possible, no? Without any money to, to publish a book and spend two years uh, uh, with, uh, you know, photographer, with photography and everything. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's possible. I mean, overall in my, in my career, I always follow that, uh, that idea, no? I mean, when I was working in finance for a, for a big multinational, I mean, with my salary, I could afford to live in, uh, in mid-levels and, and have like a certain standard of living. But I thought like this is, I mean, I'm, I spent most of the day working. So it's, maybe it's not worth it. I don't, I don't need to show off uh, what, I, what I have. But they, instead, I kept it. And then uh, five years later, I'm still uh, surviving with that, uh, with that money, without touching any other, any other savings. But what I, what I mean is uh, if you allow yourself to have that time and do the things you like, that opens a lot of doors. So mm -hmm. at, uh, at this moment, I'm doing other things and the... Uh, and, and this project opens so many doors of uh, things I could do uh, that I, I didn't know that I was going to be able to do them before. But now, like, this uh, project opens so many doors. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 
So <laughs> let's say, I mean, you have these passion projects. Do you expect them at some point to become in income generating? Or do, do you just want to carry on um, that it's a philanthropic thing, it, it is helping people and that is enough for you? Well, I think it's, a, it's impossible that something that you're really passionate about and you do quite well, that it will not generate money eventually. So ah. I think uh, it's, it's a matter of time that, mm. uh, I mean, depending on the way you focus it, then you could, you could make it into a money-making venture. So mm. that's... Uh, I think that's uh, that's fine for as long as uh, as it's something that is uh, that society needs. Mm. That's that's the main that's the main thing. No? Mm. So yeah, absolutely. I would say that uh, I mean you, you, you need to, to to do your numbers right to see if uh, how much time you can spend on, into that. Uh, but yeah, I would encourage anybody to to at least try at least try a bit to to do something that they feel very passionate about and that they think is meaningful. That's very inspiring. You know, sometimes I've noticed that we are very affected by what people uh, think of us and of course our professions. I remember that when I first started off as a flight attendant, and that was for various reasons. The fact that of course I love to travel, I, I, you know, I, I love the money that came with it, various other reasons. Um, I know that a few people commented, oh, but that's not really a career. It's not really a profession. You know, uh, trying to make a distinction between what is professional and what is just a job, a, voc a vocation. Do you ever feel that people have questioned you uh, about your career choices and asked you questions like that? Oh, is this a profession? Is this kind of so social enterprise? Does it qualify as a career? Um, I don't know. Uh, do you have any experiences to share about that? As a comedian, that's like a daily basis. Forget even oh, really? comedian friends, okay. just people on the streets going like, "This is what you do." I'm like, "Yeah." They're like, "Wow, I'm so sorry. Do you need to like hear some lunch?" I'm like, "No, it doesn't work that way." Okay, it, it's actually not that bad. I mean, I still have family who are still kind of unsure. Like, "Oh, you, you're still doing the jokes?" I'm like, "Yeah, yes, I'm still doing the jokes." And they're like, "Really? You still?" I mean, okay, that's interesting. I didn't think it would last this long. I'm like, "Well, I'm still here, aren't I?" And usually, my my like I said, I have a simple threshold. If someone says, "Oh, is this really what you do? You think this is a career?" I'm like, "Have you?" bought a ticket to my show and if they say no i'm like good night we're done with this conversation okay mm -hmm. you never came to my show and that's why i'm not rich okay so but at the same time i tell people though is that first of all let's get a definition of like how much money do you have to make to be quote unquote you know living well if i want to live on the peak then sure as a comedian i highly doubt i'm going to be there anytime soon but if I'm fine with just you know, having a simple life where I have three meals, you know, it's basic life and I can enjoy my hobbies, then I think, you know, I'm pre doing pretty well. So that is that as well. Secondly, also is that if anybody comes up to you in today's world and says, oh, this is this is a job, clearly already shows you that they're still stuck in the old school mindset of like you need a brick and mortar, four walls, office space, you know, a nine to five kind of thing. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. If anything, go talk to like YouTubers, ask mm -hmm. them. And if they're willing to disclose their income, you'd be like, wait, how much? What? You do what? And you just talk, what? How, how, how do I get into that? So there's a lot of that misunderstanding, right? And I don't blame anybody. I just say because you're still stuck in the old mindset of like, how does that make money? I don't know how to make money, so it cannot make money. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you're limiting yourself. So the same with comedy. I mean, there are comedians who will be doing years and years of free gigs. There are comedians who make this their living, you know, and it's really how you play the game. And if you're good enough, people will want to buy your service. It's as simple as that. If something's yes. good, people want it. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I've been to, to a few Vivek shows and, and you can feel it. It's like uh, you can see that he's in this element and he's super good. So it's, uh, there's, no, there's no question about it. For me, in my case, I've been questioned many times, like, why do you do this uh, career move? It doesn't sound intuitive. It, sound, it, it doesn't sound like it leads to anywhere good. But then if you, if you just follow your, your heart, you, what, what, because nobody, nobody's going to tell you what is, a, uh, what is your mission in life, right? They don't know. Yeah. you're the only one who knows what the, what feels right or what doesn't so mm -hmm. yes and, and the thing is that the, the moment you take that path and, and, and you do something something else you may eventually connect it with something else that you did in the past that didn't make sense either but then you connect both things and you're probably one of the few ones that uh, have done those two things and you can you can be in a position that uh, maybe not all people are in so you can do things that uh, that are that are worth it so Yes, I think the key is not to, I mean, to listen to people, yes, but uh, at the end of the day, you need to do what uh, feels right for you. 
I think with too much, you, you're so right that it is like you, we're so much, uh, we pay so much attention to what uh, what people say. And and maybe people in our close uh, network, they do it uh, with a good intention. Like mm-hmm. they, they, they want to advise you, like, this is what I could do. But uh, hey, you're not, you're not me. How can you, how can you tell me? But even if we don't think about other people, don't we go through moments of intense doubt? We ourselves can be, um, you know, we can go through days when we feel, is this really ever going to work? Is this going to take off? Because I'm sure initially there are many failures. How do we get through that period, that period of uncertainty and maybe a bit of mistrust in our own ability? Vivek, would you like to start with that? You know, that is why you need to open your mind and meet different people. Like when I first met Oscar properly in person to talk and we just started talking and just things just clicked and you would, you would first of all get motivated. Like, wow, this guy's doing this. this is so cool. You know, if someone like that can survive, like what's stopping me from my crazy idea. So like when I go to schools, give talks and everything, I talk to kids and I say, you know, whatever crazy dream you have, just remember there's an Indian guy in Hong Kong who's surviving doing Cantonese comedy. So you better have something really wild that you think is not going to work out because this apparently is working. So have a reconsider about what you want to do. But as you hear different stories, meet different people, you realize that, wait a second, you mean this is possible? You mean that is possible? And eventually you build up this mentality of like, well, I mean, if all those people seem to be surviving, clearly I cannot be so out of this world that this will never work out. So I think the doubt definitely is there, but that's when you you need to have the maintenance period of, it's kind of like saying, Every now and then you need a little vitamin supplement. So in the same way, like watching something like this, hearing different stories, reading like the Dear Hong Kong, reading those stories. I'll tell you, the Dear Hong Kong book, it's a really good thing where just flip a random page. And when you have it like, oh man, my life is terrible. Oh my God, I, this is horrible. Whoa, they did what? And they're doing what now? Wow, okay, you know what? I mean, my life is not that bad anymore. Boom, you have an example. Or like some days you're like, oh, I don't know. I don't think, you know, this is crazy. No one around me is doing anything good. Everyone seems to be looking down upon me. I'm useless whoa, these people are cool and they live in Hong Kong too. You're telling me this city allows this to survive? Okay, I can do this as well. So simple things like that. You need some sort of random motivation every now and then to just wipe out the doubt being like, come on, wake up, wake up. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. The doubt is there, but okay, wake up. Look around the world. There's a lot more than you think it is. True, true. But you see it. Normally at the, at the beginning, we have this, uh, we tap into our intuition and we, we see it very clearly. It's like, this is what I want to do. Hmm. But then after that, then the overthinking comes and we start uh, going around and the self-doubt uh, comes in. But I think the intuition, the first feeling is golden. It's like we, we need to listen to it more. And then that will stop us from the overthinking. And then, oh, maybe this is not going to work. Yeah, it was a good idea, but then no. And, and then if we go back to the first feeling, it's like it's so clear. This is like, this is, this is me. This is something I have to do uh, no matter what. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I'm also looking at the questions um, that we have received from our audiences right now. And one of the first questions is, um, uh, is from Meg. And she says, can you share some tips on how you discipline yourself to work without a boss breathing down your neck? <laughs> the easiest way is all the bills you haven't paid, put them on your wall. Every day, I wake up and like I gotta pay all this stuff. Okay, I better get to work. I get to work. <laughs> all right. I wonder if you need any motivation from a from a boss behind. Like, if whatever you're doing, it's a it's something that you feel like doing. You probably don't need any motivation, right? So you just uh, need to go ahead because that's uh, that's your inner drive. Okay. Oscar, exactly. I mean, uh, this is one thing I think Oscar and I will agree is that if anything, you need not motivation, you need someone to say, stop, enough. You got to take a break now. No more. No more work. Put that away. You don't need to work on the project. I know, no, enough passion. Stop it. So hmm. you will actually have that reverse. Sometimes you overwork yourself because, like, but I can, I guess I still want to do, you know. I would say, honestly, the discipline thing comes because you're forcing yourself to do something you don't want to do. Now, initially with anything we do, like for example, what Oscar's working on, what I'm working on, the jokes don't just come, boom, you know, I have to sit down and force myself even on days where I'm like, oh, I don't want to write, but you got to do it. But it becomes a pattern because you are doing it for yourself. You're enjoying it. And then you reinforce it by doing it, enjoying it and looking at the rewards. You're like, I did that. And that reinforces the, the future discipline of like, I did that. I want to do that again. So I get to do this again. And it's that kind of mentality. So again, 
go back and kind of think of like, what is it that you are willing to wake up every day and work on for eight hours? Hmm. I go to schools and I talk to kids and they're like, oh, I'd love, you know, what, what would you love to do all day? Oh, I'd love to sleep. Okay, so let's think about this. You slept for eight <laughs> hours, you wake up and you sleep another eight. Can you do that? Yeah, sure. A whole week, every single day. You tell me you're doing 16 hours a day of sleep. Well, you know, maybe not. I'm like, there you go. So that's not your passion. What is your passion? Oh, basketball. Are you going to play basketball eight hours a day? No, just maybe one hour a week. That's not a passion. That's a hobby. Okay, so coming back. So once you found that thing, like, you know, I really enjoy, I don't mind doing the dribbling all day and, you know, just shooting hoops for 10 hours a day. There you go. The discipline will just come because you love what you're doing. And Oscar said exactly, like, you don't, you, you won't need as much discipline as you think because you're not breathing down your own neck. You're just in, motivated to do what you want to do. And that's mm -hmm. exactly, and that's why you got to go take a step back and figure out what is it do you want to do. That's a great answer. And yes, we have um, lots of questions from the audience. And I'm, I'm just taking a look at um, like all of them. Um, They're coming on gradually one by one. Just um, one second. I so I that, that answers Meg's question. Then um, um, there, are, there are some questions about cultural diversity and inclusiveness as well. Um, and we were not able to talk a lot about that in our initial conversation, but I think it's a, it's a topic worth considering. So um, anonymous, they haven't identified themselves. They say, how do you compare Hong Kong as compared to other cities like London and New York? What should Hong Kong do more to promote inclusiveness? Oh, this is, this is a 10 hour topic for us to discuss. <laughs> I'll give you my take. Like I have the benefit of growing up here as I went to a local Chinese school and I speak local Cantonese, which makes my life like a dual identity where I can be a local and a foreigner at the same time. So I definitely get to see Hong Kong from both sides. So I would say it's really how you play the game. I tell people that Hong Kong to me is a game rather than a city. If you know the rules, you know how we play it, then you can enjoy it. For example, you know that you stand on the, the right side of the escalator. Don't be the person who stands on the left and forces <laughs> everyone to stand behind you, but never say, Mgoi te te. nobody does that stuff. You know, simple things like that. And you will appreciate the city for what it is i think wherever you go in the world honestly i've been to new york and everything and it's got its fun parts it's got its cool things but it's also got the other side like for example i was in melbourne and every year i go there for the comedy festival and first week every single time I'm like wow blue skies space people wow coffee yay right two weeks into it i'm like people come on let's go let's go the bus stop is so far away why cannot be it next to like come on people there's space on the train get on the train why are you standing there Come on. So these small, small things will happen. I think, again, it, every city's got its nuances. So Hong Kong's got its opportunity. That you can have fun with it. It's really how you play with it. And someone like myself and Oscar, I think the fact that we're kind of these playful mentalities just makes it so much more fun wherever we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oscar? I think the answer for that is, very, is the very core of what we do at Dear Hong Kong. Mm. So what we try to do is, uh, is get more people interested in, in, the, in the, one of the beauties of uh, Hong Kong. Because, you know, like uh, New York City claims to have all the nationalities in the world represented there. And London may have uh, the same, but, and, and Hong Kong is not that far. And we really need to take advantage of that because it's not something that uh, is in our disadvantage. It's actually something that makes us strong. So whenever somebody in Hong Kong that say, oh, this Wilos, these foreigners, they're just, uh, you know, they're, they're there, but uh, I mean, they, they, they can see us as, a, as an opportunity to learn about uh, all the ways that uh, looking at the world and uh, other experiences. I mean, since I was a kid, I was super interested in whenever I see somebody that is different than me, I wanted to know more about them. I wanted to ask them uh, about their experience, about the, and you know, through the Dear Hong Kong project, we realized that uh, we're all quite similar, but we have our own views about the world that, I, that makes us grow. If we, if we know, if we share all of these things. So I would say like, it's a, it's a good opportunity for people to get more out there and whenever they, they have the opportunity to find somebody from a different place that they they take it. And they, I mean, probably English, it's, some people get very shy about uh, speaking English, but then, I mean, they can do it. Like whenever people say, oh, I don't speak very good English, but then they do. And we, you can understand it, we can understand each other actually. And of course, for us, uh, we need to make a big effort. I mean, uh, we like to speak uh, Cantonese, I don't, I just can mumble some words, but, uh, but even like that, even if I say just a few words in Cantonese, people are like, oh, and then they're more eager to, to talk and, and, and share experiences. 
I mean, there's one more question for you because, um, of course, Vivek has been in Hong Kong forever. Uh, so the situation is a little bit different for, for him. But Oscar, um, again, one of our audiences is asking us, what made you choose Hong Kong? I mean, there's so many uh, multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, cities in the world. What made you decide that this is going to be your base? This is where you want to promote people's awareness about cultural issues, uh, et cetera. Yeah, we have a, this question so often, like people are so interested, like why do people come here? What are they doing here? <laughs> but then I like the answer is, uh, I mean, through everybody that we interview in the project, they come to Hong Kong either for work, for money or for love. And that's, uh, or just like in a very random way, like I came here for 10 days and then I stayed, like I felt comfortable or something. For me, it was work. So I was a... Uh, I rejoined this, uh, this company, I wanted to stay in Asia, and then there was a position in Hong Kong to cover Asia, so I was uh, in Hong Kong half of the time, and then the rest of the time I was traveling around Asia. And then I, I just uh, liked it and I stayed. So very boring, but <laughs> very simple, but yeah, like once you, you're in a place that you really feel comfortable with, and through the Dear Hong Kong, Hong Kong project, we have been kind of exploring what makes uh, Hong Kong special. And I think the moment you tap into those uh, things that uh, like intangible things that uh, most of Hong Kongers have, then they, you feel comfortable and you, you stay. Mm. And since we are on this topic, I'll just ask another question from the audience, which is, Oscar, did you encounter a big cultural difference between Spain and Hong Kong? Uh, pace is kind of slow in Spain and even got siesta time between work hours, ha, ha, ha. So what do you think about the cultural differences? Yeah, I like the ha ha ha. So yeah, <laughs> we, we don't, we don't anymore. It's, it's, like a, it's like a stereotype. Yeah, people used to have it uh, back in the days, but uh, you know, through my, my company is, was Spanish and, and we, we will have like a very long hours of, uh, of work. So it wasn't, I mean, the, the pace is not that, uh, that slow. So in that regard, it's a, uh, we don't do as much overtime. That's one of the that's one of the things. If we really have to, then yes. But uh, otherwise, we wouldn't do it in a regular basis. And that's something that I think in, in Hong Kong people should pay more attention to, because they feel like oh, working overtime is normal. Having stress at work is normal. Mm. It is not. It is not. Or having your boss breathing at your back is normal. It's not. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like uh, we should redefine like what. What, what do we expect from the workplace? Do we really want to work like this? Uh, or maybe we want to do something else that uh, would make we feel more comfortable with. So these kind of things, uh, from my perspective, uh, they're not as normal as they, they sound like in, in Hong Kong. No? That is true. That is true. And here's another question for both of you. Um, the, audience asks, the audience member wants to ask us whether... Although Hong Kong is considered an international city, much more can be done to bridge the gap between the local and the international community. How do you suggest we go about it? Vivek, uh, your views first, please. Well, first of all, I keep telling people when I, like I said, when I go to talk to youngsters or go to schools, I tell them, first of all, let's understand Hong Kong is an international city because it's made up of international people. That's the first thing. So rather than saying, oh, you're here just because we allow you here or you're just you know, a small minority. Remember, it's that small minority that brings out the internationalness of Hong Kong. It's kind of like saying you cook a great dish and wear the salt. You might say, but you're just salt. You're just seasoning. I'm like, you know what? All those flavors that's in your dish is because of us. That's what they're coming out from, okay? So think of it that way. Secondly, there's a lot more, if we go back to the history of Hong Kong, a lot of iconic things that represent Hong Kong, like the Star Ferry, Hong Kong University, stuff like that, was, was brought about by a lot of people, Chinese, non-Chinese put together. And I keep telling people, I'm like, so the things that you identify Hong Kong as actually was made up by everybody, everybody together. So it's not really a matter of like, oh, you know, we're letting you play with us. It's like, no, we're playing the game together. You don't tell the goalkeeper in the soccer team like you know we're giving you a chance to get on the field no 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 i'm on the team the ball may not come to me all the time but i'm on the team okay you need yeah. me there right yeah. so simple thing that i say that's the ment mental shift so rather than saying you know hong kong is made up of 97 or 90 93 percent chinese and seven percent non-chinese think of it as hong kong is made up of all these people and sure if you look at numbers there's a majority over there but it's because you have that minority that makes it so much more diverse and fun to play with rather than saying, you know, this is a Chinese community and we have a few who are non-Chinese. 
you know so yeah. get that out of your head you need the mentality of like it doesn't matter if you're chinese there are many people who are chinese skinned but they mm -hmm. probably speak worse cantonese than me so how do we do those statistics you know who's more chinese there so again if you look at it from that point of view that people's got different stories different backgrounds different histories and why they're in hong kong so get to know that and you realize that yeah hong kong is actually all sorts of stories everyone's mm -hmm. got a different story your skin color is almost irrelevant at this point yeah yeah you're yeah, right mm, oscar yeah, I mean, uh, well, uh, actually, I would like to hear this uh, uh, opinion afterwards. Like for us, like uh, Vivek was mentioning, we, we do have a map of uh, Hong Kong in the Dear Hong Kong book with uh, well, all these landmarks. So that's a starting point to realize like, okay, maybe uh, Hong Kong was uh, built on these foundations of diversity. It's not something new. Like I've been in Hong Kong for 10 years, maybe I'm relatively new comer, but uh, there have been generations and generations of uh, other ethnicities in, in, in Hong Kong and actually doing great things for the city. So that's the uh, first thing to have in mind. I think for me, it, uh, it works everywhere, like to, to do a, a little reframing in our mind, like to think like, I am a migrant. I mean, no matter who you are, you are a migrant. Or maybe your parents were migrants or your grandparents were migrants. Probably the majority of Hong Kong, if we ask ourselves these questions, we realize like we are migrants. And then that changes totally your point of view about others. It's like, oh, a fellow migrant? Yes, we all are, in a way. Like, we all come from different places. And, uh, and that's beautiful. That's beautiful that we can, we can see each other at this level. And then a lot of uh, us uh, versus them kind of questions will disappear because there's no such a distinction. Mm, yes. And the What's your view about it? What, what do I feel about how these yeah. gaps can be bridged? Mm. Um, I think um, a lot of it goes to the kind of daily conversations. I'm a teacher, so of course I try to do it in the classroom, but it could also be through daily conversations we have with people. So people who come to Hong Kong sometimes can say things like, oh, these, um, you know, Hong Kong people can be very impassive. You can't understand what they're thinking or uh, they, they don't come across as very emotional. You know, there are all these generalizations. And I said, well, have you got to know them? Have you actually gone out uh, for dim sum with them, right? Then the other accusation is, oh, why don't they speak English properly? Why don't they know these street names? It's so frustrating. And I go, well, we can try and learn those street names in, in Cantonese as well, you know? So it's a, it's a two-way process and it's very easy to blame the other ethnic group um, for, for not being our way, but, um, but to suggest to them that actually we can take a look at things from their perspective as well. Um, that I think helps a little bit because people are so entrenched in their own ideas. Oh, why don't they speak English? Oh, they, they don't like us. Um, well, that's not the way it is. I think it's all about making an effort to understand people. Um, yeah, that's my take on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, a few more questions that we can probably address before uh, we run out of time. Um, so Anonymous says, any memorable experience during your stay in Hong Kong? And uh, Vivek, would you like to take that first? Well, for me, it's on a daily basis of where people assume I don't speak Cantonese. Less now because people know who I am, but back then I would love it. I, I, I love how people the most private conversations next to me on the bus or whatever and i'm like i heard everything thank you that's your password okay i will get your money from your account something silly things like that right um at the same time also it's the the response i get honestly whenever i speak to a chinese person and i say something in cantonese they're not just like wow good for you you speak it they're like whoa oh wow I, I, wow that's so cool they're like just so fascinated and yeah. also appreciative right and oh yeah it, it's very unfair because i always tell people like like if someone a non-chinese person says something in cantonese like lay home they're like whoa you uh, whoa, good for you i like you you know but reverse it if my chinese friends go up to their chinese family like i speak english like so can i what's so special about you it's really unfair <laughs> but I, I love that we get that advantage but i think that's the the thing is that if you're willing to take the first step People are very appreciative that, hey, you know, you're willing to come take one step. I'm willing to go take one step as well. And for me, that happens all the time where someone will come to a show and initially may, they may have thought like, oh, let's just see this guy be funny. And afterwards, they're like, hey, I really enjoyed like you. I really had a good time and I never thought I would laugh that much or whatever. And 
first of all, Hong Kong people are not complimentary people. We don't feel that we need to go up to let you know for a service I paid for that it was worth the money. They don't. There's no need for doing that, right? Nobody goes to the bus and says, thank you for the driver, none of that. We're not in Vancouver or anything. But the fact that someone enjoyed it, they will feel the need to let you know, hey, I, I really appreciate that. And when you hit that level, oh, you've connected on a different scale. So those moments for me are really memorable. When people come up saying, I really had a good time, I'm like, oh, th thank you, thank you. You know, and those mean a lot. Yeah, yeah. Oscar? Well, I think for me, you know, like the, the way uh, Eggy and myself started this project, I met her, she's the co-founder of uh, Dear Hong Kong. So I met her at the schools. So she works for this uh, social enterprise called Intercultural Education. They invited me, I volunteered to go to, to Hong Kong schools and share about my culture. So mm -hmm. we were doing like, a, I don't know, like talks about climate change or, or uh, pop culture in Spain, but also like I went there and did a cooking show for the students. And I think it's the reaction of, uh, of the students when, they, when they're close, they have the opportunity to be close to, to somebody different and they're so curious and they look at you with a lot of curiosity and ask a lot of questions. So I think it's just a question of getting this spark and, and let them ask and, and, and be interested in, in, in what you what is different in you. So I guess very memorable to see their, their faces and their, their really eagerness to, to learn about something different. Hmm. Um, and uh, we have uh, one more question for Vivek um, because he speaks Cantonese. So there's a there's a person saying, I am an NCS who is studying in secondary school. So NCS meaning non-Chinese speaker. And Vivek is my role model. Please give me some advice on how I can improve my Chinese. All right, quick tip, get a, get a Chinese girlfriend or boyfriend. Bam, immediate improvement. Maybe not in your speaking, but very good with your listening skills. You'll be a better listener than ever. Honestly, mm. the best way that I improved my Cantonese was through activities, just basically group activities, let's say sports or any sort of fun activity that you just will do something together. And over time, you will just speak the language because you're interacting in a different way. You're not doing exercises like, okay, let us now discuss about this topic. Boring. But if you were, let's say, playing hockey or playing soccer, all of a sudden, you know, you learn the phrases here and there and they want to talk to you afterwards and say, hey, you know what, let's do this next time. Let's try that strategy. That helped me a lot. Um, yeah, watching TV, you know, listening to songs and stuff like that is there, but it's very passive. You want something that you actively want to speak the language. So I would say definitely enroll yourself into more activities, whether it is a sport or a, a simple hobby or even like online stuff where you're just you know, playing games together but having to chat together. And that will improve very immensely because you will enjoy it. You will enjoy the process and you'll want to speak the language. That helped me a lot. That definitely was a key component. Okay. I have been trying to learn Chinese for the last one year, more formally, and I have to say it's very, very difficult. But when I do say something, oh my God, the sheer joy on lo local Hong Kongers' face, it, it, it's, it's just so rewarding. And as you said, they take the time to appreciate it, and, and there's nothing like it. Um, so so it's, I don't see that kind of racialization that people talk about. All they want to see is that you understand them, you make an effort. Uh, Oscar, um, have you have you tried to learn uh, Cantonese so far or Mandarin? I have tried to learn uh, Cantonese, but uh, I have to admit that it's uh, it's hard. Like if okay. you don't, uh, and especially if it was, you know, at the time that I, I came to Hong Kong, I was working in different Asian uh, countries, uh, and then uh, my company gave me the chance. Like, uh, do you want to learn Mandarin? You want to learn Cantonese, or you want to learn any other language? And I chose to learn Japanese because it was easier for me. And I thought like, okay, my, my Japanese colleagues, uh, the same way that we don't actually understand each other because of the cultural differences. So maybe with the language, it's gonna be easier. So then I focused my energy on the, on the Japanese. Then I did the Cantonese lessons on the side, mm -hmm. but then I didn't get uh, so far, but maybe maybe in the, in the future, who knows? Gradually. And but uh, it's uh, hard. Oh yes, oh, tell me about it, yes. And they understand that. They understand it's a very difficult language to acquire. Um, so before we end the session, I have one more question, which is that um, you're both um, not ethnically Chinese and yet you are here trying to bring about a change, uh, trying to transform people's opinions and perceptions. Do you think that that is difficult considering that your ethnic background is different to reach out to local people? Uh, do you see any kind of resistance or do you think it doesn't matter? 
I mean, you know, some people can say, well, you're not one of them. How can you understand and how can you communicate with them in a way that that really reaches them or has an impact? Um, I know it's not, not the easiest of questions, but how would you respond to that? And, and what kind of responses have you had from, from the local populace? I think Oscar and myself are being the polite gentleman of like, is he going to say something? I'm going to wait unless he's going to do it. I think it's okay, I'll do it, i do it. <laughs> Go for it. Okay, okay. <laughs> thank you. No, I think, I mean, you're right. Like uh, people say, oh, you're different than us. Uh, I mean, in my case, uh, I don't know. It's like uh, with, uh, with the given ethnicity you have, you have like a different behavior from people. I mean, in my case, yes, it has been uh, at the beginning hard to, to connect with people because being different, being perceived as being different. At times you have like, a, I call it like a positive discrimination. It's like I, I felt like uh, during these 10 years in, in Hong Kong, I've been discriminated positively just because of my energy. And, and I, I think it's, uh, I feel uncomfortable with that. Sometimes it plays to my advantage, but sometimes it's like, well, I don't like this. I, mm -hmm. I want to perceive as the as a, as a same level, right? But yes, I think the, the ability to connect to somebody at the human level is universal. So at first you may perceive this uh, kind of uh, Very. Uh, distance or something but then in the end it, it works i mean there's so many things that we can use to connect with people mm, very good answer. i fully agree with oscar on that one i mean honestly if you spoke to someone like oscar or myself for the first five or ten minutes your brain will probably think yeah but you know he's different he's not pretty fair you know he's not really chinese but after 10 minutes of talking your brain will slowly go like wait a second i'm just talking to a person hold on a second this is just a my brain forgot this identity or like how different we are, the same we are. And within 20 minutes, you're just hearing someone share their story. So yes, there is initial resistance or initial curiosity of like, oh, are you guys all like that? No, I'm very disappointing if you have all those stereotypes in your head because none of that is true. And so it takes maybe 15, 20 minutes of them after a while going like, oh, so I mean, you're just similar to everyone else? Yeah. And you're doing this? Yeah. Huh. Okay. I guess then that doesn't make any special for you. I mean, the game's the same for all of us. So exactly. I would say definitely the difference is going to be for sure. It's, it's two ways, as we talked about earlier on, where when people listen to us, they're going to be thinking, yeah, but you're different. And the same way I'm like, well, then, you know, you're different too. So why should I learn your language? Because this language is for you, not for me, right? So it's all these small, small nuances. And I would say, as Oscar said, ultimately we're at the human level. If you come to a point of doing something you enjoy, it's – irrelevant what your skin or background ethnicity is it's like you're doing what you're in your moment you're you're in your essence and people will see it they'll see right into it mm. but you see in a i tried this uh, this game a little bit in, a, in parties or something or somebody you meet for the first time try to have a meaningful conversation without asking them where they're from or what they do in life like try to skip those things that people are so eager to ask at first to, to kind of put you in a box I tried to skip those. And, and, and whenever I managed to do that, it was kind of beautiful to have the conversation like, we don't care where we're from or what, we don't care what we do. We just care about our humanity, you know? Really, really try and that. you connect with people much, much better. Mm. And uh, of course, we are at the end of time. So uh, before we go, is there any message, anything that you would like to share with our audience? Uh, Vivek and then Oscar? Honestly, the best thing is just figure out yourself the best way to figure it out is be honest with yourself and ask yourself many questions like who am i what do i want to do and be honest i mean write it in a journal that no one else can read and that way you won't have to pretend to write something that's right just write what you think i want to be an astronaut well there you go go for it mm -hmm. i think the, the advice i would give is that uh, people should uh, i mean if they're thinking about a career change or something like that i mean through life like uh, you, you can fail many times. Like you can try things uh, because we're, we're saying like, oh, follow your heart or something. If you follow your heart and it doesn't go anywhere, then try again and, and do something else. We have a lot of time to, mm. to play in life and to experiment and experience and, and grow. So mm. it's, uh, I would say like, uh, yeah, a lot of opportunities ahead. And the moment you see a lot of opportunities ahead, then, then your life changes a bit. Absolutely. And, and to stay in a bad job is to basically waste your whole life. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Completely agree. And thank you so much for being here today. Even though we had just an hour, hour's conversation, I think the insight we got from both of you was uh, very, very rich. And hopefully it will inspire people who are listening. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you, Oscar. And I hope to yeah. meet you both again very soon.
Thank yes. you so much. Um, thank you, Vivek. Uh, thank you, Oscar, and thank you, Aditi, for moderating the program. Um, so we are on behalf of Asia Society Hong Kong Center. We are very grateful for your sharing um, and your journey of like an alternative career path. Um, I think uh, what, during the discussion, one of the important message is uh, not about our differences, but also our similarities. Uh, while we may choose different career paths uh, at different uh, crossroads of our life, uh, we still have the similarity um, of being a human, human. And then it's important to be honest with ourselves. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I just wanted to share this quick survey that we started doing. Uh, we really care about how our audiences and members think about programs. So if you would like to uh, give some comments, uh, please scan the QR code and give us uh, some feedbacks uh, for our coming, upcoming programs and also this program. And then I would also like to take this time to share uh, two upcoming events. So one is uh, Unseen Enemy movie screening on the 2nd of July. Um, so we will be screening uh, this movie on the pandemic, which is very relevant to uh, nowadays situation. Uh, we are very glad to have uh, three professors from HKU to share their insights on the uh, pandemic and then what will uh, happen in the coming years. And another program is uh, Hong Kong Financing Asia's Growth. Uh, we'll have the Chief Executive Officer from H uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange uh, to share about the green finance and also um, Hong Kong's role in Asia's financial market. Um, in, so, and finally, uh, we have this new membership offer uh, in celebrating our 10 years of Asian Society Hong Kong Center uh, in Admiralty. So, um, if you're interested, please go to our website uh, for more information. So, thank you all so much for your time. Uh, have a nice evening. You too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.